This is an NBC News special presentation. Some of the images and language in the following program are graphic and might be disturbing to some viewers. While the images have been available across the Internet, they have not been seen nationally in their entirety on NBC. Fifty years ago, the nation lost an extraordinary leader. The time is always right to do right. A warrior for justice. We ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. His fight <laughs> is our fight. It was one of those fateful intersections in history that was very important. We are here to say that we are not afraid. One of the reasons why Martin Luther King was so successful was that he understood television. Thank you, Dr. King. He understood that imagery was everything. Show the pictures. Show the images. When violence is that visual, it prompts people to action. Shameful. Arresting children for what? The right to vote? Dr. King understood that you need to make people own their shame. It looks like the tear gas is coming. Their down. story of struggle and triumph. They took them into corridors and alleys and began beating them. Is the American story a story still being told? Right here. Dr. King said you have to create a crisis so that the power structures are forced to answer. We want the world to see. On July 6, 2016, outside St. Paul, Minnesota, officers pulled over 32-year-old Philando Castile on a routine traffic stop. You have a license for insurance, sir? I have to tell you, I do have a okay. firearm on okay. me. Don't reach for it, then. Don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. with me. We got pulled over for a busted tail light in the back. And the police just, he's, he's, he's covered. He they killed my boyfriend. He's like just 40 seconds after the last shot was fired, her four-year-old daughter in the back seat, Castile's girlfriend, Diamond Reynolds, began streaming video live on Facebook from her cell phone while the world watched. And the officer just shot him in his arm. Get the female passenger out. Right now, with your hands up. Exit now. Keep them up. Keep them up. Face Where's my daughter? You got my daughter. Face away from me. We know how this story goes. He was reaching for the gun. I had to shoot him. We know that. She knew that, and she refused to let that be the narrative. <laughs> she is going to force people to bear witness to this and to see something that has largely been rendered um, as being invisible in this country. It's okay. I'm not here with you. Before the world ever heard of Philando Castile or any of the other young black men whose public killings awakened the consciousness of the nation, there was 14-year-old Emmett Till and his grieving mother, Mamie. Live streaming your loved one's death is a 21st century version of what Emmett Till's mother did. She live streamed her son's death. Mamie Till's stunning decision to publish a photograph of her murdered son, Emmett, forced the country to confront the horror of racism and set in motion the modern civil rights movement. Americans, they can tell you where they were when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, or when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. For many African Americans, they remember that moment when they saw Emmett Till's photograph. I don't know a black person who doesn't know the name Emmett Till. I don't know a single black person who has not seen that image. We were about the same age, the same age, matter of fact. It was horrifying. It was my 9-11. It was basically, you know, uh, an act of terror. In 1955, Mississippi was ground zero for racial terror in the American South 
when 14-year-old Emmett Till arrived from Chicago to visit his great uncle, Mose Wright, in a town called Money. He was a big city kid. He wasn't familiar with the dark heart and the social taboos of the Jim Crow South. Black people and white people interacted only on a transactional basis, but they were largely two different worlds. You stick to your own kind, we'll stick to our own kind. One day, Emmett and his cousins go into town and they go to a little grocery store, Bryant's grocery store, and something happens inside. According to Carolyn Bryant, the wife of the proprietor, the woman who ran the store, Emmett Till, alone in the store with her, comes on to her and whistles at her. Four days later, Bryant's gun-toting husband and brother-in-law went looking for the boy at his uncle's house. And Mose Wright begs him to leave him alone. Please don't take him. But they take him, and he never returns. He's thrown into the Tallahatchie River with a 70-pound cotton gin fan attached to his neck with a barbed wire. A few days later, a boy fishing in the river discovered a body beaten beyond recognition. The body was so badly damaged that we couldn't hardly just tell who he was, but he happened to have on a ring with initials. And that cleared it up. In Chicago, Emmett Till's grief-stricken mother, Mamie, waited at the railroad station for the casket containing her son's body to arrive. Mamie Till is essentially confronted with a sealed wooden casket nailed shut by the sheriff. It was Mamie Till who demanded that that box be opened so that she could see her child. She kind of staggers in and sees this body, and she can't believe her beautiful child is this lump of flesh that's lying in this casket. And she said to herself, the country is going to have to confront this. I'm not going to suffer in this by myself. If this is what you're going to do to black boys, you're going to look at it. Not only did Mamie insist on keeping Emmett's casket open for the funeral, she invited photographer David Jackson from the weekly black news magazine Jet to take pictures of his body. She and the editors of Jet Magazine made the decision that they were going to display this for the country. All issues of Jet sell out. They published it again the next week. All issues sell out. And it's only in the black press owned by Johnson Publishing. The white press didn't even see it at first. There was quite a controversy about why would Jet print this terrible picture. They wanted to make a point just to show you how bad things were. Mamie Till had something very important to teach. Show the pictures, show the images. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. I believe that the whole United States is mourning with me. And if the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died. Mamie Till, I think, got more viscerally than anyone that if she didn't show those pictures, he would just be another black boy gone dead. Roy Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, were arrested and accused of murder. Their trial was held in Sumner, Mississippi, just two weeks after the funeral. Although black reporters were kept separate, it was one of the first times in the South that they were permitted to sit in the main courtroom with the rest of the press. Instead of being up in the balcony, frequently called the crow's nest, they were allowed to sit at a table on the ground floor, not that far from where the white press was seated. That was considered a breakthrough. Among the journalists covering the trial were Jet reporter Simeon Booker and freelance photographer Ernest Withers. 
Withers' photograph of Moe's Wright on the witness stand, defiantly pointing to his nephew's murderers, captured a rare moment, a black man bearing witness to racial terror in a Southern courtroom. The Ernest Withers photo of Moses Wright standing up at the trial of Till's murderers was taken surreptitiously. I think that's the number one image that most people remember. The trial lasted four and a half days. One journalist called it the first great media event of the civil rights movement. I've just received information of an acquittal in the murder charge of Emmett Till in LaFleur County. After little more than an hour of deliberations, the all-white jury acquitted both defendants. It took 67 minutes. And one juror said, it wouldn't have taken us even that long except we stopped to have a soda. While the defendants escaped punishment, they would not escape judgment. After the trial, this man, journalist William Bradford Huey, persuaded them to sell their true story for $4,000. Huey sold the story to Look Magazine. It's the ultimate insult to injury, having just been exonerated in this sham of a trial, only to, with no fear of double jeopardy, tell their story. Yeah, we did it. Here's how we did it. Deal with it, America. Remarkably, 62 years later, in 2017, Emmett Till's accuser, Carolyn Bryant, recanted much of her story, admitting that she lied about what happened that day in the store. Look Magazine never published the graphic photographs of Emmett Till's mutilated corpse, and few white Americans saw them at the time. But soon, a leader would emerge who understood how images of racial violence could bring about change, and he would force the nation to face them. This is just the test that we're getting ready. Uh, That's what we've be... done. Now, next oh, time we go, it will be for real. This is rare early footage of the 27-year-old man who, before long, would become a legend. But in 1956, Martin Luther King Jr. was a little-known minister and the leader of a bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, that started when activist Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man. This is a non-violent protest using the method of passive resistance. Martin Luther King was a man of huge thoughtfulness about the, the strategy that he had asked those who followed him to use. And that strategy was that in the face of violence, you had the moral high ground if you did not return violence with violence. Negro passengers have been humiliated, intimidated. At first, the young minister who went by the unassuming name of M.L. King was only covered by black journalists writing for black papers. In particular, the Birmingham World, a black newspaper, and its editor, Emory Jackson. He writes about, long before anyone else, that Dr. King is invoking Gandhian principles. He becomes referred to in the black press as the Black Moses. The white editors, they were just living in a different world. The majority press, the white press, basically ignored African Americans, and not just episodes of violence against them, but achievements. Um, anything to do with their daily life, uh, basically flat out ignored them. They didn't even often use the names of black people because that would be a sign of respect. It's galling now, now to look at the level of disregard and oblivion uh, that, that was in the media at that time. 
as long as you sit in the back, you have a false sense of inferiority. And so long as you let the white man sit in the front and push you back down, he has a false sense of superiority. Montgomery bus boycott. Unbelievably successful from the very first day. And it took weeks to get a national reporter in there. I think it was six weeks before a news magazine came in, and then 12 weeks before a major newspaper came in. We have no moral choice but to continue the struggle, not for ourselves alone, but for all America. King developed a strategy of resistance that was designed to challenge the status quo while never making white America feel threatened. He consciously set about creating a character palatable to all of America. Martin Luther King understood that if you're only telling the story, you know, among the black press and among black people, you're, you're preaching to the choir. You've got to get outside the church. What special instructions or advice has been given the Negro people? If there is violence, that it must not come from Negro people. King's efforts to woo the media started to pay off. Soon, King was the story, and the story was the movement. More than 12 months now, we, the Negro citizens of Montgomery, have been engaged in a nonviolent protest. The boycotters faced death threats and persecution, but under the leadership of Dr. King, they mounted a successful and peaceful campaign. Facing financial crisis and failing in the courts, the city of Montgomery relented and ordered that black passengers be allowed to sit anywhere. America likes a winner. The media loves a front runner. One could argue that if, if, if Dr. King's first foray into on national television had not been a success, would the media have turned around and gone home? I don't know. We'll never know, thank God. It's early morning here at 1121 Cross Street in Little Rock, and a new school day is dawning. A year after the Montgomery bus boycott, Little Rock, Arkansas became the stage for the next great drama of the movement when local NAACP leaders handpicked nine black students and pressured the school board to enroll them at all-white Central High School. They were challenging the city to comply with the Supreme Court's 1954 decision in Brown versus Board of Education, where the court ruled that all public schools must be integrated. Ernest Green, age 16, 12th grade. When they said, are you interested in transferring to Central? I said, hey, why not? My attitude was that change was coming. I want to be a part of it. I'm ready to change the face of the South. The story took an unexpected turn when the governor defied the courts and ordered the National Guard to block the black students from entering the school. The first day we faced the Arkansas National Guard with bayonets. They let the white students into the campus and barred us from entrance. It was surreal. Outside the school, an angry crowd gathered. The minute they walk in, they walk when out. we walk out. Mm -hmm. And it's not right, they have schools just as good as ours. Eight of the nine black students arrived together that first day. Only Elizabeth Eckford, whose family didn't own a telephone, arrived alone. Elizabeth didn't get the message that we were going to meet at the 14th Street side of the school and not the 16th Street side of the school. We, we had the protection of each other. And this group of ministers, Elizabeth didn't have anybody. She really took the brunt of it that day. This black young teenager, all by herself, being frightened and, and screamed at, it's the first of a series of images showing how powerful and, and virulent Southern white racism was. Traumatized by the reaction of the crowd, 
Elizabeth refused to speak to news crews. Can you tell me your name, please? Are you going to go to school here at uh, Central High? You don't care to say anything, is that right? There was one journalist Elizabeth agreed to talk to, Moses Newson, a newspaper reporter for the Baltimore Afro-American. When I heard about it and rushed over and she recognized me, and she said she would talk to me. You know, and she sat there talking about what had happened to her. And I know she said, as soon as Miss Bates said, if we can go back, I'm going back. And that just always sort of stuck in my mind, something that this 15-year-old girl was saying. After a three-week standoff in Little Rock, a federal judge ordered that the Arkansas National Guard be removed. The following Monday, September 23rd, the black students once again attempted to enter the school. Photographer Earl Davey and three black reporters, including Moses Newson, follow the students there. We are walking up 16th Street. Someone up front yelled, they're in our school, and all hell broke loose. Earl Davey runs. Someone tackles him, they take his camera, and they smash it to the ground. L. Alex Wilson, the editor of the Tri-State Defender, just keeps walking. Still photographs caught that. Well, take that and just magnify it a hundredfold to show you what television was giving. You know, I looked at television and there was somebody beating Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson was just being pummeled. In fact, one of the guys said, run, damn you, run. And he just kept walking. Wilson creases his hat, puts it back on, and he keeps walking. His expression doesn't change. L. Alex Wilson's decision not to run in defiance of the mob was rooted in an incident from his boyhood in Florida. As a kid, L. Alex Wilson had seen the Klan come to town, and he ran, and he hated himself for having done that, and he said he would never run again. He's 49 years old. He's got nerve damage from what happened in Little Rock that day. Three years later, in 1960, age 51, he is dead. Good evening, my fellow citizens. For a few minutes this evening, I should like to speak to you about the serious situation that has arisen in Little Rock. Mob rule can not be allowed to override the decisions of our courts. Within hours of Eisenhower's announcement, as the American public watched in shock and disbelief, a thousand federal troops marched into Little Rock, and the Arkansas National Guard was federalized. It was a huge television event, the president speaking on TV, ordering federal troops into an American city so some black kids could go to school. The fact that he used a thousand paratroopers to provide protection made a hell of a statement, especially in the black community. Black people were used to the government being against them, not for them. So the notion of troops being used for African Americans was a revolution, a revelation, and a novelty. We were blessed by the fact that these images were shown by the media because there probably were other cases before us in which there was no media, no image. You know, if a tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear it? Before long, millions of Americans would hear it and see it.
nearly every American heard about the Little Rock Nine. The story gave a boost to the movement, and the movement gave a boost to the fledgling industry of television news. Television was just breaking through to being the national medium for news. Not every American home had a television set. We were sort of making it up as we went along. Baba, how do you feel about going back to school on the second day? I feel pretty good about it, although it is sort of a nervous spot to be in. This was the world of 15-minute news. People like Mike Wallace. And tonight we bring you a special interview with Governor Odell Faber. And John Chancellor. What we can report this morning is that... We're in Little Rock. They, they begin their careers. Then what you expected, or... Well, there are people who come up to me and say, you know, they begin their evenings by seeing what we were doing. Reality TV. We were early reality TV before we knew it. It was one of those fateful intersections in history that was very important, both for journalism and also for the African-American and the cause of human rights in America. Martin Luther King's strategy of nonviolent direct action inspired a wave of young activists to take up the cause. King was able to energize young ministers, young students. He set a tone of let's come out of these cathedrals, let's come out of these offices, and let's do something in the streets. Beginning in February 1960, in cities from Greensboro to Nashville, black students sat down at lunch counters and refused to leave until they were served. Sit-ins introduced a new, more confrontational tactic to the movement that provoked white segregationists to violence. Then in May of 1961, 13 activists, black and white, calling themselves Freedom Riders, boarded two buses in Washington, D.C., a Trailways and a Greyhound. Their goal, to desegregate interstate bus lines in the South. Among the group's organizers were student leaders John Lewis and Diane Nash. By now, the activists knew the crucial importance of media coverage and were leaving nothing to chance. We knew that if one of us did not interpret what we were doing to the press, somebody would step in and, and try to do it and get it all wrong. And so I was elected to be the coordinator. There is this story when Diane Nash and these guys are on the Freedom Rides, Siegenthaler, who worked for Kennedy, said, they plan to kill you when you go to Mississippi. My father, he and Diane Nash had a conversation. He didn't want her to continue the Freedom Rides. He said, you're gonna get somebody killed. You're gonna get somebody killed if you keep this up. And she said, you don't understand, sir. We signed our last will and testament last night. We understand exactly what we're facing. In my capacity as coordinator, several of the students who were about to get on the bus gave me sealed envelopes that I was to mail in the event of their death. Their route would take them from Virginia and the Carolinas into the very core of the Deep South, Alabama and Mississippi. In Atlanta, Martin Luther King warned the Freedom Riders that he received word the buses would be attacked before they reached Birmingham. Undeterred, the Riders continued on. The Greyhound was the first to arrive in Alabama. When they get to Anniston, some Klansmen, white thugs, stop the bus. They firebomb it. There's a reporter, Moses Newson, on this bus. Neither he nor anyone on that bus imagines that they're going to be able to get out alive. Editor has a close brush with death. When I found myself in that burning bus, set on fire by the mob, that cold, chilling realization that this might be it came over me. They were using boards and chains, daring people to come out and integrate Alabama. 
I decided the best thing for me to do was to stick the camera up under my seat. I had no thought about stepping off the bus with a camera hanging around my neck. Moses Newsom quite reasonably figured out that if they knew he was a journalist and not a freedom writer, that he would suffer an even greater punishment than the freedom writers. Reporters gathered at the Birmingham bus station to await the arrival of the second bus. A mob of club-wielding segregationists waited there too. The bus came in, they collected around it, they dragged about six of the passengers out, both Negro and white. They took them into corridors and alleys and began beating them, began hitting them with lead pipes. At that point, someone behind me whispered in my ear and said, someone here has identified you from having seen you on television. They're hunting for you now, you'd better get out. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. The segregationist power understood that the press doing its job had become their enemy. We would like to have all the press, all the news media, right over here for private company. In, in every way, as strong and as, as dangerous to them and to Jim Crow and segregation as the civil rights protests. Information media, including the TV networks, have publicized and dramatized the race issue far beyond its relative importance in today's world. They're cold and a little cramped, but not hungry. The people who hated us, called us outside agitators, thought that we were of a piece with the civil rights people, that we were hand in glove. It's all one-sided. And the newspapers and a TV camera all one-sided, too. They take pictures of one and won't take pictures. And one of their favorite epithets was to call us white Negroes, except they didn't put it quite that way. If I paint myself black, I'd be on TV every night. White bystanders harassed us with homemade clubs, cursing us and blaming the press as the cause of the demonstration. Standing against them were the segregationists. I covered a nighttime demonstration in Marion, Alabama. Somebody walked up behind me and hit me with an ax handle. Somebody came up and asked me, he said, do you need a doctor? And I put my hand behind my head and it was all bloody and I said, yeah, I think so. And he thrust his face right into mine and he said, we don't have doctors for people like you. It was personal. It was you. It was not bullets flying in the air that could hit you. It was you that they wanted to do harm to. Of course it was dangerous, but the truth is that the number of times that we faced danger and the kind of danger we faced was very small compared to that with those who took part in the movement. We bore witness to what was happening. We were not participants. What we did was say, here it is. You face it in your living room as individuals, as a family, as a country. Six years after Emmett Till's murder, the state where he was killed, Mississippi, emerged as a fortress of Southern white racism. I love Mississippi. I love and I respect our heritage. Mississippi had always been just a place apart to me. It was the South Africa of America. It was a place you didn't really want to put your foot. Now, a civil rights maverick would strike at the venerable all-white University of Mississippi, known as Ole Miss. University of Mississippi had not had any black folks as students ever. An extremely single-minded young veteran, James Meredith, decides he's going to go to Ole Miss and will not be deterred. I have decided that I, J.H. Meredith, <laughs> will register. One impediment is removed after another by the courts. 
who keeps saying you can't keep the guy out. Mississippi's governor, Ross Barnett, had no intention of complying with a court order. He stood defiantly in the door of the registrar, blocking Meredith's way. Ole Miss, he said, would remain all white. I, Ross R. Barnett, governor of the great and sovereign state of Mississippi, denied to you, James H. Meredith, admission to the University of Mississippi. This was such a strong, crazy reaction to this lone Negro entering the University of Mississippi. Being on the Ole Miss campus this weekend is something like being in the eye of a hurricane. There was a real sense of foreboding among many, many people, including reporters, including myself, of no good can come of this. On the side of opposing James Meredith, you have people flooding in from Alabama and other states who have nothing to do with the University of Mississippi. Literally hundreds of outsiders came pouring into the campus armed with shotguns, pistols, clubs. It was like a Nazi rally. The mood was total anarchy. I was the first black woman, full-time reporter at the Washington Post. I was not the part of the team that was covering the, the events on the campus. There's no way black reporters, we would have all been dead. We had tried to be on campus. Hundreds of U.S. Marshals, sent by President Kennedy to protect Meredith, poured onto the Ole Miss campus. There was this amassing of forces, federal forces coming in from Memphis, military troops coming in. The federal Marshals had seized control of the Lyceum, which was the chief administrative office uh, on campus. It was where we assumed that Meredith would come to register as a student. So a crowd of several hundred people gathered in front of the Lyceum. Their first arrival on the campus was greeted without incident, but then when word spread that Negro Air Force veteran James Meredith was on the campus, the fighting started. It developed into you know, this gunfight that went on for, uh, for hours. I sought refuge in uh, a girl's dormitory the photographers did not want to use flashes any more than a television camera person wanted to use a big light because you would beat up someone who's, who was using a flash. And in fact, they did. Before the night was over, the violence had claimed two lives. One was a French journalist named Paul Guillard. He had a bright red beard and red hair. Probably part of the reason that he died is because he was clearly identified as a member of the press. His body was found over near behind a women's dormitory, and he's been shot at close range, unsolved to this very day. By the next morning, the riot was quelled. Under heavy guard, James Meredith was finally allowed to register and attend class at the University of Mississippi. He remained enrolled under the protection of U.S. Marshals until he completed his coursework the following year, becoming the university's first black graduate. Mississippi mood, hope and fear. The hope is that Meredith signals the coming of the light for all of them. The fear is that the inevitable changes will bring further death destruction and repercussions. Go home, man. What can the past Go home, man. tell us about the future? This city is run by criminal niggers. We're not nonviolent. We'll kill these people if we have to. Nazis go! Nazis go! As writer William Faulkner said, the past is never dead. I'll shoot you. It's not even past. I think anybody who witnessed what happened on the campus of UVA couldn't help but think that maybe the hands of time have swept backwards. No, 
My blood. My blood. I know all this is my blood, yo. Ole Miss and UVA, what the two have in common, of course, was this violence, this hatred on display, unapologetically. Things that we thought we had moved past, and a lot of people thought, you know, how far have we really come? You are God's children. We ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. One of the reasons why Martin Luther King was so successful was he understood television. We deliberately had demonstrations before 12 o'clock <laughs> in order to get the film to New York. Uh, they had to leave by one. We cannot in all good conscience obey such an injunction. Dr. King and his staff were very, very savvy. They, they knew exactly what was going on. You, you, you want me to just make a statement and not interview, you don't want to interview. You and they strategized how they could use their coverage to their advantage. We must be willing to fill up the jails all over the state of Florida. There's nobody that could make an hour long speech any better than him. But for the six o'clock news, you had to get your message across. It had to be 30 seconds or less. The time is always right to do right. And we cannot wait. We cannot continue to accept these conditions of oppression. King would dramatize and force the media to deal with the issue. I've got to grab your attention without losing your interest and respect. And King mastered that. But for all of King's sophistication, he could still be outmaneuvered by a clever adversary and risk losing control of the civil rights story. I've often been told that I was welcome down here, but uh, I didn't know whether I would be or not. Laurie, L-A-U-R-I-E, Pritchett, is the police chief of Albany, Georgia. And he set about doing things differently King used the student's method of direct confrontation in Albany, Georgia. However, Police Chief Pritchett cleverly countered the nonviolent demonstrations with nonviolent arrests. All right, under arrest. Dr. King thinks he's going to draw violence onto protesters, but the police chief down there was actually very savvy. He decided he was not going to play to the television cameras. A ban on demonstrations has brought more than 1,500 arrests of desegregationists so far. They prayed, they were asked to move on, they refused to do so. Are you under arrest? Pritchett jails Dr. King and a lot of other demonstrators. But his goal is not to let them have their way and stay in jail long enough to generate a lot of press and a lot of publicity. This is one time that I'm out of jail and I am not happy to be out. Out of jail and out of the headlines, King seemed momentarily out of options. And the National Press Corps knew it. Reporters present Albany as a big defeat. It's viewed as, as a serious political setback for Dr. King, and in part because there had been absolutely no white violence whatsoever against black demonstrators in Albany. As long as civil rights activists were just being quietly and respectfully jailed, the media didn't really care about that story. King knew he had to get the movement back on track, and to really make this notion of nonviolence work, he had to find a place where there would be resistance, where people could really see the ugliness of what they were confronting. He recognized that nothing was going to change until and unless most Americans were exposed to the reality of what was going on. 
So if that's what he needed to do, was provoke a reaction on the part of bigoted Southerners who were all too willing to play their part. He just had to bring them to the fore. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. Theophilus Eugene Connor, Bull Connor, he was the police commissioner in Birmingham. And he was large and he was in charge. Uniformed forces of Birmingham led by Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor, who says, we were trying to be nice to them, but they won't let us be. The decision to do protests in downtown Birmingham is a very calculated decision to see what Bull Connor is capable of doing that will attract the attention of northern white journalists. Birmingham is a symbol of hardcore resistance to integration. I have the feeling that if we can get a breakthrough in Birmingham and really break down the walls of segregation, it will demonstrate to the whole South that it can no longer resist integration. King said, we've got to go for broke, we have to do something dramatic. And the first thing his, his advisors told him is, don't tell your father, don't tell any of your immediate advisors, they don't want you to go to Birmingham, they think it's too dangerous and, and, and you don't have a chance to win. Grown adult protesters get attacked, the media covers it, but after a while that tactic doesn't draw the media anymore. So then King thinks, what can I do now? That's when he decides to have the Children's March. That was very, very controversial. To put children in a situation where you knew that there was going to be violence visited upon them. We had never done that before. We had never had children before, and we didn't know what could happen. These are some of the 1,100 children of Birmingham who demonstrated in the streets and went to jail, and then were either suspended or expelled from school. These were 11th and 12th graders who were mostly 16 to 19. They were very mindful of the fact that in another year, they could be sent to Vietnam to die for freedom, abroad for somebody else. The students cut classes and took to the streets by the hundreds, following Dr. King's tactic of going to jail deliberately to dramatize the Negro protest against segregation. Unlike Albany, the supply of recruits for the so-called nonviolent army was unlimited. During the weeks-long Birmingham campaign, King himself was arrested. From his cell, he composed one of the movement's seminal documents, his letter from a Birmingham jail. He wrote, We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed for years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. We must come to see that justice too long delayed is justice denied. More than a thousand school children, first high school students, then much younger ones left school and headed downtown where Bull Connor's troops waited with fire hoses and dogs. Dr. King realized that if you have embers and you have gasoline, all you need to do is get a spark and things will uh, burn. We had instructed people, you don't run from dogs. You back away from them. You continue to look at them. I was 16 and I was stupefied by those images. And I see these six-year-old kids marching into dogs and fire hoses, singing freedom songs. And when they see the dogs and the fire hoses, they don't run. They would pin us to the light pole to keep us from going any further down the street. And you had to hold on to keep from being rolled down the street. You'd have to describe it as what hell must look like to see human beings 
being treated that way. Screaming, especially little kids. I've got tears in my eyes right now. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's hard. Well, these were children with ribbons in their hair and little dresses on who were getting beaten up. They weren't dressing up in their finest Sunday clothes to get blood all over them just for kicks. They were dressed that way so that they were the maximum amount of sympathetic. When violence is that visual, it prompts people to action, it gets people's attention in a way that any amount of intellectual discussion can't even approach. The constant pressure of these stories the pictures of the police dogs and the fire hoses and the kids being arrested, those were all powerful firecrackers, if you will, on policy in Washington. You start to see the country as a whole saying, this is intolerable, this has got to stop. And that puts the pressure on. By now, the mainstream press was, was covering all the horrible things in the movement, and particularly what had happened in Birmingham. And that's an important moment in time because it kind of opens up the door for Lyndon Johnson. It gives him the space needed to, to pick up the torch from President Kennedy and push through the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In August 1963, King staged his greatest production of all. This time, the drama did not come from images of violence, but from the astonishing sight of a quarter million peaceful protesters from all walks of life descending on the nation's capital. But I have a dream. My poor little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Viewers around the world watched transfixed as a parade of celebrities, black and white, called for unity in the struggle for racial justice. Mr. Brando, what sort of an impression has this day left with you? It is possible for all men to come together in a sense of goodwill and to uh, solve problems in a democratic way. The truth of it is that the March on Washington was what transformed a Southern, predominantly black movement into a national movement. It meant that we were not just an isolated movement. This movement became a universal movement. There were whites protesting alongside blacks. The news cameras couldn't look away, and ultimately it really changed the evening news as we know of it. Late today, the federal government... Nightly news was only 15 minutes during the sit-ins and the freedom rides, even the Birmingham crisis. But by the fall of 1963, CBS first went to 30 minutes. NBC, Huntley Brinkley went to 30 minutes. Speed and efficiency in the New York and Washington nerve centers of NBC News. These now make possible the expansion of the famed Huntley Brinkley Report to a full half hour. Television became a bigger presence in people's lives just in time for Freedom Summer and the peak of the civil rights uh, era. The explosion of media attention inspired a surge of new recruits, mostly young and white, into the movement. We all feel hopeful that we are going to be able to do something and that something really will come out of the summer. What uh, areas will your main activities be in? Well, primarily, we're working on voter registration, various forms of political education, and then what we call freedom schools. One of these young leaders was Bob Moses of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. SNCC was thinking about how to get their point of view in front of the press. We understood that it didn't matter that black people got killed. We saw that what attracted the media to the whole campaign was the influx of Stanford and Yale. We, we have been invited, and uh, we're simply helping people. The students representing 
the elite structures of the country. I really believe in these things that may sound idealistic, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and I think it's important for everybody to have these. It was clear at the orientation that the media were latching on to every young little white girl they could find who would be, you know, post a picture back home. That's what the press was interested in. That's what brought the press, right. clearly. And I'm just wondering if people in this room understand, one, that people should be expected to get beaten, they should expect to spend in jail, and it may go beyond the summer when they're in jail, and that they should expect possibly somebody to get killed. I don't believe that one single white person who came there felt that they were being used. People came. They were warned from the outset they, they, something terrible may happen to them. Nick, in your own mind, have you thought about the dangers in Mississippi, that you might come into physical harm? Uh, yes, I certainly have. And I, I think As a recruiter, I was asking not, not only for their name, the address, their parents and everything, what is the newspaper in your hometown? Who should we contact if you get arrested, if something happens to you? Even if, if what well, some of us are killed, even if I am killed, we, we will have been, we will have died. Each death is going to bring Mississippi nearer to reconciliation. Oh, I was terrified. Before, during, it was terrifying. Young men and young women take up the burdens of their convictions. Without ceremony, occupied with the paraphernalia of departure, they go. The media was going to follow the kids in. They set forth for a summer in Mississippi. The most dangerous time, it's the entry point into Mississippi. We would have been all right if everybody had gone down together with the whole press. That was their protection to enter Mississippi. However, soon after arriving in Mississippi, three volunteers, two white, one black, left the group to investigate a church burning. Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, two white Jewish kids and a black kid from Mississippi had not come back by the appointed check time. The three civil rights workers who disappeared in Mississippi still have not been heard from. People are calling reporters saying there are missing civil rights workers in Mississippi. That was one of the reasons that allowed for this real convergence of press interests that went right up into the White House. Miss Werner, I have talked to the governor there, and he is making all the facilities of the state available in the search. It became the dominant story of, of the summer. Did Mr. Schwerner ever tell you in his own words why he came down here? He wanted to find what he could do about an intolerable situation. Very quickly, the media focused on Rita Schwerner, the telegenic wife of missing activist Michael Schwerner. That the people in this country have had enough. They went all over Rita. And Rita was about five foot two and she weighed about 85 pounds. They went up to her and they said, Mrs. Schwerner, how do you feel? And Rita wouldn't play. She said, you would not even be interviewing me if my husband was black. And it was true. It was true. Mrs. Cheney, the wife of one of the missing white men has said that the only reason this case has attracted national attention is because there are two white northerners involved. Do you believe that? Well, that's what I feel, too, because I, if he was by himself, I doubt that we would ever know anything. The bodies of Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were found in an earthen dam 44 days after their disappearance. Question facing everybody under the sound of my voice tonight and every person who lives in this nation. Not so much who killed those young men, but what killed them. And when we move from the who to the what, in a strange sense, that death involves all of them. The reporters in the civil rights movement were presenting stories that made average Americans question their accepted reality. The 
bombing of this church claimed the lives of four little girls attending Sunday school. People didn't know black people very well. They weren't aware of, of what lives were really like because black people were largely invisible to most of white America. There have been five church burnings in the past dozen days. All the churches were Negro churches. People couldn't believe it at the local level, but all over America. They read about it, they saw the photographs, they saw it on the news. People identified with us. From a writer's life. Selma, Alabama. March 7th, 1965. It was a sunny but chilly Sunday morning as more than 500 civil rights demonstrators made their way to the main business district of the city, ignoring the stares of the white people and defying the court order of a local judge as they headed in the direction of the bridge I was sent as one of three reporters for the New York Times to Selma. I'm watching with this photographer, McNamara, a few other reporters. We see young John Lewis. I don't think he was more than 23 or 24. He's a very young man, scrawny little guy who didn't seem to be very formidable or enduring, but he was. We're marching today to dramatize to the nation, dramatize to the world, that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens of Alabama, but particularly here in the Blackville area, denied the right to vote. Well, in Selma, Alabama, in 1965, only 2.1 percent of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. The Board of Registrars is not in session this afternoon, as you were informed. And the only time you could attempt to register to vote was the first and third Mondays of each month. So we had to do something. We had to act. I was almost certain that on that Sunday, if a couple of hundred people walked across that bridge, they would simply be turned around. I figured there's going to be trouble. So I found a spot where I could see what was going on and had access to a telephone. The camera was right at the foot of the bridge. This is an unlawful assembly. You are ordered to disperse. This march will not continue. Troopers advance toward the group. They just charged. And they charged throwing tear gas bombs. It was quite a shock. They came toward us, beating us with night sticks shrimping us with horses, and releasing the tear gas. Clouds of poisonous smoke rising from the sidewalk high as the bridge itself. People in silhouette, because you couldn't see very well. We were pushed. My legs went from under me, went down. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I thought I was going to die. I thought I saw death. No matter how much you describe it, how much you show a still, the words and that still picture do not have the impact of the motion and the viciousness of the attack. The whole idea behind direct action, particularly the sort of non nonviolent Gandhian tradition, is to produce conflict in a disciplined fashion that reveals the opposition to be as morally bankrupt as it is. You want them to show themselves. And in Selma, they show themselves. I think the civil rights movement understood that you need to make people own their shame. You need to embarrass and humiliate people in order for them to stop doing the thing they thought they had a perfect right to do. In 1965, Tom Brokaw was a reporter for WSB-TV, Atlanta's NBC affiliate. 
NBC said, no, we need you at the station to coordinate all the videotape feeds that are coming in. I went to the office that day, and then we began to get these terrible reports of the violence. Turn out of smoke. I was in the editing room with all this videotape, and there was a videotape editor that I was very fond of. He was a fourth-generation Southerner white guy, and he was a decent man. And he began to look at this stuff, and I'd say, Eddie, it cannot go on. Well, I. And he, he would, well, look, here, and I'd say, Eddie, look again. I'd make him roll the tape back. These are cops, and they're beating these people, beating them nearly to death. Come on, Eddie. And he looked again, and he said, it's wrong, it's wrong. And he lowered his head. That was the power of television. It could bring it right to your home and to your heart. You could not deny what was going on. You couldn't excuse it in some way. By the mid-1960s, watching television had become a nightly ritual in most American households. Americans did what Americans did on Sunday nights. They have dinner, they watch Ed Sullivan's show, and on that night, it was the first viewing on television of the movie Judgment at Nuremberg. It's easy to condemn the German people to speak of the basic flaw in the German character that allowed Hitler to rise to power. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin. It was one of the rare times that a television network preempted its regularly scheduled programming for a news event. Order! 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 Show you order. You're breaking into the first showing of this Academy Award winning film about tyranny. The content made the average viewer say, gosh, are we like Nazi Germany? The most challenging picture of our time. Maybe at the moment, nobody really appreciated the irony, but you're watching a movie about the trial of Nazi war criminals. Suddenly, the TV switches to innocent, unarmed Americans being mercilessly beaten on live television. That's a moment that will forever be known as Bloody Sunday. This airs on Sunday night, March 7th, Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, there are over a 1,000 people from as far away as Hawaii. Before Expedia, <laughs> they mobilized instantly. I've come to Selma to put my body where my heart is to make sure that the Negro people recognize that there are white people in the North that are with them in their fight. The shockwaves from Selma reverberated around the world. Dr. King made an appeal for religious leaders to come to Selma. The ministers, priests, rabbis, and nuns came and walked across the bridge to the same point where we had been beaten. It was one of the finest hours for people to respond the way they responded. Without television, the civil rights movement would have been like a, a bird without wings. That's pretty amazing, the convergence of a media phenomenon and a mature movement coming together to shape politics. Like Birmingham before it, the brutality at Selma shocked the nation, compelling Washington to respond. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. This time with a Voting Rights Act of 1965. What happens in Selma or in Cincinnati is a matter of legitimate concern to every American. This is One Nation. On March 7, 2015, America's first black president, Barack Obama, with John Lewis at his side, visited Selma to commemorate Bloody Sunday. In one afternoon 50 years ago, so much of our turbulent history, the stain of slavery and anguish of civil war, the yoke of segregation and tyranny of Jim Crow. All that history met on this bridge. Just seven months earlier, in Ferguson, Missouri, peaceful demonstrators protesting the shooting of teenager Michael Brown were confronted by a militarized police force. All of a sudden, three uh, urban tanks came. Looks like flash grenades. There's a smoke rising up. Now it looks like the tear gas is coming out. We just need to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to know that this nation's racial history still casts its long shadow upon us. It's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the 
crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. President Johnson's 1965 speech to Congress, invoking the movement's anthem, marked the peak of the civil rights struggle. For a brief moment, the promise of a nation united against racial injustice seemed within reach. But would it last? After Selma, fractures within the movement began to show as a more militant group of activists gained traction. No. Do you think you'll be able to keep it nonviolent, Dr. King? Yes, I think so. Mr. Carmichael, are you as committed to the nonviolent approach as Dr. King is? No, I'm not. Why aren't you? Well, I just don't see it as a way of life. I never have. Newly anointed SNCC chairman Stokely Carmichael spoke for a younger generation when he issued a battle cry. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. We want black power. We want black power. It was here in Mississippi this summer that Carmichael, with his cry for black power, first became a national figure, and to many, a frightening one. It's two words that come to capture a whole host of white anxieties about race and about African American civil rights activism. It has taken off like a lightning bolt in the media. It sounds kind of aggressive. It sounds on the verge of military revolt. I mean, everybody was full of black power. It, it drew all the news coverage. In Baltimore, the concept of black power. The issue of black power here in Grenada, Mississippi. Here in Watts, black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Well, the press was fixated on the notion of violence. Are you talking in violent analogies because you want to see a Negro violent uprising? And when Stokely says black power, he's not just whistling Dixie. Three white male journalists as the panel, and they're saying to him, well, don't you really mean it's about violence? And he's saying very, I mean, very calmly, he says, when I talk about black power, I talk about black people in the counties where they outnumber them to get together, to organize themselves politically, and to take over those counties from the white racists who now run it. We just want what everybody else has. And he's looking at three people who represent, they know what we're talking about. They had to make themselves not understand him. We are not going to let these white people come into our neighborhood and kill us. They wanted to see us as only passive. It's like, oh, the bad movement has taken over. 65, that's Selma March, that was wonderful. You know, people locking arms and singing We Shall Overcome and stuff. We want to talk about this thing called violence that everybody is so afraid about. The media tends to be stuck in the narrative that they understand. As black activists became less conciliatory to white America, the mainstream media began to cool on civil rights. So far, a definitive statement on what black power is has yet to be forthcoming, except that it is damaging. For most of the history of the civil rights movement from the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s, it was easy for the white press to pick which side they were on. They were clearly on the side of the civil rights demonstrators. Black power. Black power. With the advent of black power, black power, it becomes a little bit more difficult for the press to cast it in terms of good versus evil. The message of black power, kind of like the message of Black Lives Matter 50 years later, this is a message that is geared to blacks themselves. This movement is not brand new. This is the latest chapter in a liberatory struggle in America for black people and for people of color. And what's been the response so far? The real truth of the matter is that children are the ones who are suffering from yeah. this occupation the most. My role is to take the demands from the street and make them relevant in the policy space. Brittany Packnett, a leading Black Lives Matter activist, was one of several civil rights leaders past and present invited to the White House in 2016. People like uh, Brittany, uh, who served on our police task force in the wake of Ferguson and has led uh, many of the protests. The beginning of our work in Ferguson was simply to 
help people understand that there really is a problem. That racism is not dead, no matter who was in the White House at the time. Some of our tactics were still rooted in the traditions of the Civil Rights Movement. But given that this is the next chapter, things evolve. We weren't going to sing, I shall not be moved and we shall overcome. We're gonna play Lil Boosie. We are not carrying protest signs, we're wearing protest tees. To wear your Sunday best, that was a strategic move in the civil rights movement. But I shouldn't have to dress my best for you to see me as a human being. When Black Lives Matter activists objected to the coverage of their movement by mainstream media. It's like we got a stash here of some Amsterdam, New Amsterdam Citroen vodka. They took control of their story. We were not pleased with the media because somebody would be at home watching a channel. They would text or tweet someone and say, this is the story that's being told about you. This is just John. an excuse to just go out there and rob and loot. And I know that's not true because I was just out there myself. There's police marching behind us. And that's why social media was such an important tool for us, because it allowed us to tell the truth unfiltered. Why do you need me, white TV host from New York, to be the person that points a camera at your protest? People got a lot more control over their own stories. And that's profound and powerful. It was social media that propelled the Black Lives Matter movement onto a global stage. Yes, I will, sir. I'll keep my hands where they are. When cell phone images of unarmed African Americans killed by police went viral. The body of Michael Brown laying on that ground for four and a half hours shocked America back into its consciousness once again. It woke so many people up that thought Emmett Till was a figment of the past and not a very relevant figure of the present. Emmett Till is Michael Brown and Tamir Rice and Sandra Bland and Eric Garner and all of those folks because they woke us up once again. With the rise of black power, Martin Luther King's agenda, while still nonviolent, shifted. We are tired of living in dilapidated, rat infested shacks and slums. He began to voice an even more radical denunciation of American society. To broaden his message beyond the civil rights platform, King took his movement north, where he encountered a backlash. But if there was progress in the South, there was violent resistance in the North. The nation suddenly learned what it should have known, that racial prejudice was not just a Southern problem. It was nationwide. King takes his campaign to Chicago when he moves into the ghettos there. People felt very differently when the microscope was being turned upon their own communities. I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as I've seen in Chicago. Shaken but undeterred, King returned south. He arrived in Memphis, Tennessee in March 1968 to show support for striking sanitation workers. A lot of King's advisors tell him, don't go to Memphis. It's gonna take away from your message, it's gonna take away from your planning, but King insists. We're here to help garbage workers. These are the exact types of people we're supposed to be helping. April 4th, 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. stepped out of room 306 onto the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. He told his young aide, Jesse Jackson, 
to put on a tie for dinner. I said, Dr. King, prerequisite for eating is an is a appetite, not a tie. He said, you're crazy. We laughed. He never knew what hit him. He didn't suffer at all. So I remember saying, get up, get up. He's my friend, Martin, Martin, hold on, Martin. He was gone. He was here, he was not here. God knows this is the most tragic thing that has ever happened in, in my life. When you see something like that, you never, you never really recover from such a scene. Knowing Dr. King was a marked man, news crews shadowed his every move. But at the moment of his death, no television cameras were present. The only pictures taken that day were by a South African filmmaker, Joe Lowe, who was at work on a documentary about Dr. King. I heard the shot ring out, and I rushed out on the balcony. I saw Dr. King lying about 40 feet away. I ran to help but there wasn't much anyone could do. I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. We are very upset today because we have lost somebody like a father. It's got to be Friday, it's got to. And today, many people are out here on the street wondering which way they're going to turn because we don't know where we're going to go. Do we go to the right? Do we go to the left? We're not sure today. And we've lost something, and we feel it deeply. We feel it. Our Moses, the once in a four and five hundred year leader, has been taken from us by hatred and bitterness. The white people do not know it, but the white people's best friend is dead. Crowds gathered along Harlem's 125th Street. Looting in varying degrees and some burning was reported in a dozen or more cities. An uncontrolled carnival of looting began. Dr. King gets assassinated, and cities in the north go up in flames and riots. There's a sense that the nation is on the brink of civil war. Once the demonstrators were seen out there burning down things, and they were seen as violent, all of the components that made the white man the obvious bad guy suddenly gets reversed. And that was a horrible, that was a horrible moment of watching the, watching the narrative shift. Martin Luther King's death was not the final chapter in the struggle to overcome racial injustice in America. But for a time, King changed the plot from disillusion to defiance. And despite the hate, he saw hope. Dr. King said, you have to create a crisis so that the power structures are forced to answer. We had to create crisis rooted in traditions that are far older than our chapter of the movement. The shape of the world today does not afford us the luxury of an anemic democracy. If you are fortunate, his memory can stick to your mind and inspire you to keep moving. King used to talk about that a real peace was not the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. Ensuring the presence of justice is a whole lot more complicated. The price that America must pay for the continued oppression of the Negro is the price of its own destruction. There was something happening in America that responded to his voice and his message. It is a struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. It was a moment that galvanized people and, and brought people off the sidelines, made them speak up and take a stand. This isn't a conflict between black folk and white folk in the final analysis. Justice! It is a tension between justice and injustice. He never framed this as just about race. It was to redeem the soul of America. It's a tragedy to me that he's kind of seen as a leader for black people from a different era rather than as our leader. Let freedom reign. Dr. King always said, 
you're gonna die. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. And you have nothing to say about where, when, or how you die. Your only choice is what is it you give your life for. When we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, we'll be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thanks God Almighty, we are free at last. There's a common thread I see every time I'm in the field. While this was burning, you were saving other homes. Neighbors helping neighbors and strangers alike. No official first responders here, just volunteers going in and bringing folks out. This is what America is about. What my colleagues did that night was heroic. Sometimes it's nice to see all the good that's out there. We have seen it in community after community after community. Watch NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt.